Okay, so, um, what we started off with last week then was looking at uh, man and how man was a special creation of God. Um, God had created everything, so he left the best till last, as you always do, as uh, when I release the kids from class, uh, I release the girls first, and then I say, I leave the best till last, and then release the boys. And sometimes I do the re reverse, you know, so they don't feel too uh, left out. <coughs> um, okay, so when we looked at Genesis, uh, God said, let us, let us make man in our image. And uh, we looked at what that image was. And can you remember what that image was, Ian? Righteousness, holiness, and wisdom. Okay. So, and also the sinless nature. Um, so we, we see that God had a, a special, uh, something special in mind for us as a creation. We were created to worship God. It didn't, doesn't mean that the animals didn't have uh, an aspect of of that, we know that they also have a spirit, uh, the nephesh that we looked at last uh, week, and and they do have uh, f feelings in the sense of they can feel pain, they can feel fear, and all those sort of things. Because we all have pets, we all know how they um, behave, and and they can be um, happy. You know, when your cat purrs, obviously <laughs> the cat's happy, and you know when a cat's not happy. Because all of a sudden the eyes go round and the cat goes, jumps at you. Um, so it's like when our cat was still fairly young and we used to go like that. And then all of a sudden he would jump at you, you know. And uh, so we know all those sort of things. But man was created uh, with a particular purpose and that was to worship God. And uh, we're just going to pick up a little bit more this morning about uh, man and, and man's creation. So I want us to go to, I think the first one, yep, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. So 1 Thessalonians. So if you find 2 Thessalonians, what should you do? Yeah, go to the left. <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24. 23, sorry, yeah, I was trying to say. Um, what does that say? Pardon? Okay. So, <coughs> hands being is body, soul, and spirit. Okay, body, soul, and spirit. Okay, there's three parts. Three parts to to that. Um, let's go on to Hebrews chapter four. It's always hard to juggle <coughs> the Bible. <coughs> Hebrews chapter four, verse twelve. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now look at the next phrase. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Now notice those, they're coupled together. Soul and spirit are coupled together and then we have a comma. Because normally if you make a list, don't you, you put comma, comma and something, don't you? But here we have soul and spirit, and then a comma, piercing even the asunder of dividing soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow. So what does that mean? 
Let's have a bit of a discussion about the soul and spirit and then a separation of the joint and marrow. So the soul and spirit are so closely related that it's like the bone and the marrow yep. are so closely related. It's kind of drawing a parallel. Yes. That they, they're so close, but yet they're still separate, but they're still so close. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's uh, one point. What are the joints and the marrow? What would you classify joints and marrow to be? In the bone, yeah. Joints are in the bone. Joints are in the bone. Physical, the physical things. So the body, yeah, the body. Okay, so we have the, the two aspects of the spirit and soul, which are not really body, is it? It's not our flesh. You can't see it. It's invisible. Pardon? Metaphysical. Yeah, okay, I'll use those words. Um, and then we have our body. So when the word of God divides asunder, what does that mean of those two parts, doesn't it? It divides two parts. Now how can it do that? Or what, what does that do for us? I'm just taking a little bit of a rabbit trail here. So when we read God's word or when we, be, when we realize that we're a sinner, uh, that we are in need of a savior, so the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder of, as we look at that verse uh, again, uh, powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Where is the, the piercing happening? <laughs> the soul and spirit the metaphysical yes and the physical it's actually it just clicked upstairs I've never seen that before before we're saved yes. we are as the animals in a sense we're yep. spiritual beings yes the soul uh, the word of God splits us from our base nature and brings alive again from the soul and spirit. That's, that's what right. it's doing. It's splitting us exactly. away from the base to the holy. Correct. Yes. And so, yeah, so that when we are split, right, we become, we, we all know that we are just using this body. Mm. And we know that absent from this body is to be present. present with the Lord. And so God splits that, the word of God splits that apart. Otherwise, we would still be joined mm. together. And the word of God pierces us. But you would stay asleep in the grave when you die. Well, not really, because you st well, you go down into into hell and then raised yeah, but later. The people that don't believe in that, they obviously think you all stay together. Oh yes, yes, you stay together. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. So th those that believe in soul sleep, don't they don't. <laughs> sort of see the separation of the two that, that the body and the, the soul and spirit and, the, and this, you know, it, it's amazing how God writes his word and preserves his word because he clearly separates, because normally if you're going to list something, you write soul, comma, spirit, comma and joints and marrow wouldn't you? but that's not where the split happens and that's why he says the, the soul and spirit, comma, mm -hmm. and the joints and marrow. Mm -hmm. So that's very key, very uh, very key point. And that goes on to the thoughts and intents too. Can of the heart, yeah. yes. Yep, yep. It starts to show the importance, how I know the opposite comma. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is... Um, and what did you say, Jan, about the next... Oh, yeah, and, and, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay. Um, let's move on to Genesis, back to Genesis chapter 2. So do you see what we're saying? Yes? Yeah? Because that's very important. 
to realize that there is a splitting or a separation. Okay? So that when Paul says, you know, absent from bodies to be present with the Lord, it is, that's how it works. That's how it works because of God's word, uh, because of the Lord, what he has done. Um, so if you take nothing else away from Sunday school, uh, take that away. It's free. I'm not charging you. The Lord might charge you. Um, so, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Again, we see this two separation things, don't we? We see that the dust, or God creates man from the dust of the ground and then God breathed life, or, yeah, breathed life into that creation. Where does life ultimately come from? From God. Okay? Where does eternal life come from? From God. Okay? This body is a body that will return back to the dust. Back to the, the dirt, if you like. There's that real separation uh, from that. So, made from the dust of the ground, which is the body, if you like. And then we have God breathed into man the breath of life, the spirit, and man became um, a living soul. Man became a living soul. A complete spiritual being and alive. Okay? So, it's not said that man became spirit and soul. But God inbreathed spirit in breath spirit, and man became a living soul. Everything that has life is dependent on God. God created the animals. Animals have life. It's dependent on God. Without God, there is no life. And without Christ, there is no eternal life. We have life. You know, Adam and Eve... When they sinned, and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden, were they still alive when they left? Yes. Did they have eternal life? Physically, they died, didn't they? Adam's not alive today. Eve's not alive today. Who died first, Adam or Eve? Well, maybe it was Adam, because men always die before a woman. <laughs> okay. Um... So, man become or became a living soul or a completed being once God breathed into Adam that life, the breath of life. Um, so, God, God's life took possession of clay and as a result, man had a soul. As God has a spirit, soul and body, so man has a spirit, soul and body made in God's image. As God is a trinity, so... Man is a tripartite being. Does that say that God, the Father, or, or God has a body before the incarnation of Christ? Or are you saying you have a not physical body? Well, it, it, it's very hard to explain, isn't it? You know, because God is omnipresent. Yeah, he doesn't so, have a physical body. He doesn't have a physical body as such. He has some sort but, of <laughs> I just because it says you know God has no bodily part. No, that's right. But He can appear to have bodily parts. Yeah, he wrote yeah. on the wall and, yeah. and all those sort of things. Yeah. And um, it said that He, um, the world is His footstool and, and things like that. So um, it sort of means that you know there's lots of imagery that goes with all those sort of things. Yeah. But when God said, you know. Um, he made man, body, soul, and spirit. And we know that the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we know that when Christ said, see me, see the Father. So when we want to see God, who are we going to see? The Lord Jesus Christ. And he has a body. Um, we can't see the Holy Spirit. We can see what the Holy Spirit does. 
and how he moves, um, just like the, the Bible describes it as the wind, yeah. So we can see that we can't see the wind, but we can see the trees move and, and the everything else moves. So we can see the effects of it. Um, and then we have God the Father as well. Not three separate gods, by the way. Okay, one God. There's only one God. Um, okay, so man is a triune being, and so we have the entrance then into the um, spirit or the spiritual and the soul through different ways. Okay, so what we um, get into. So let's go back to uh, that passage in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> okay, so Hebrews chapter 4. So again, we'll start from um, verse 12, and then we'll move on a little bit through this. Uh, these verses. So, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, comma, okay, so the importance of the soul and spirit is separated from the flesh, which is the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when you look at that for a minute, and, and Jan sort of alluded to, to that a moment ago, he knows our thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, the heart is just a body, isn't it? It's, it's an organ. It's, it pumps blood. And um, it's, there's nothing more to it. It's just a muscle. Okay. So what does it mean then that um, the joint and uh, marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Where's the heart? Where's the heart of man? Pardon? In here. Okay, it's in here. Because that's where you do your thinking, isn't it? That's where you do your your rationalization of anything that you do. So you, you rationalize what you, you know, what am I going to have for dinner? So you try and rationalize what, what have you got in the fridge and what have you got in the cupboards and you try to, to formulate a meal out of those things and, and uh, or, you know, you've been offered a, a position or a job or there's a position that's vacant um, and you try to rationalize, you know, what you're going to do. Are you going to apply for that job? What sort of, uh, you know, how successful do you think you're going to be and is it worth me applying for this job and, and what's the financial side of things? Will I have to move to another town or a city? Will I have to move um, companies or whatever? So there's a whole thing's thoughts and intents goes on in here. And when it talks about the heart, the heart is really the mind. But everything has to come in to our thoughts. Okay? Um, if I didn't have any other senses apart from my sense of thing, you know, it, it's... How do you decide on things? Things have to come in. So we have the, the eye gate. We have the nose gate, the ear gate, the, the mouth gate, and the feel gate. That all enters in. That all enters in. So, the, you know, the, the um, Sunday school song that we sing, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, and all those sort of things. Um, is, is really important that we because they all come in I mean you can't help you know when you're, when you're in the classroom and you hear kids talking away about different things and you know they're off task you know but they say, are you listening to our conversation Mr. Borsman well I can't help it it just goes in doesn't it when someone's speaking it just goes in and uh, when you looked at something, oh, I shouldn't have seen that. You know, it's too late. It's gone in. You know, things like that. So um, that all enters in. And we've got also the imagination. 
as we've got here in this passage here, uh, thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Okay, so the Lord knows everything that we see, hear, think, and do. And so all these things go into our soul and affects us in some way. Okay, affects us in some way. Doesn't matter what people uh, do, say, it affects us in some way. So the gates to the body in the outer circle are the five senses, sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. So it affects us, we know, I mean, if we were to go blind, it, it'll affect us. If we were going to deaf, we, we to become deaf, it would affect us in some way because it stops us from functioning uh, properly, okay? Once those things are in, in to our bodies, that helps us determine things, doesn't it? So if we see something which is dangerous, we avoid it. Okay? If we hear something, um, like the other day, there was kids popping balloons and things. Uh, not balloons, what were they? <coughs> popping in, in the palms. Well, they were popping something. Now, if we were, if we were in a country which was... Uh, had issues with um, terrorists and terrorism and things like that, we would be really on edge. And a person who's come back from the war, who has suffering from, was it PTSD, um, would also be on edge. And um, so whatever comes into the ear affects us in some way. And it stays in. And um, experiences do that. That's why when soldiers come back from... Vietnam or Korean War or even the Second World War or whatever war, um, it affects them because of the things that they've seen, the things that they've done, um, and that. So the body, the gate to the, the senses, and of course they are very important senses to us. Then we have the gates to the spirit, which are imagination. So these are these gates, imagination. So we have the ability to imagine things. Okay, we have the ability to imagine things. We have the conscience. We have memory. Um, we have affections. We have reason. And all those sort of things come in uh, as well. And then, of course, we have the gates to the soul, which are faith, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. So that, that tells us that we are something which is unique apart from the animal life, okay? There are some things which the animals can experience. They will experience pain. They will experience all these other outside things, okay? They, you know, they have a heightened sense of smell, you know, animals. I think the dogs can, their sense of smell compared to us is like they can smell things on the football field. Is that right? Something like that. It's, it's really quite large compared to our sense of smell. You know, if, if Jan were to be lost in a shop, you know, and I have to find her, uh, I wouldn't go on the floor and start sniffing for her <laughs> sense of smell, okay? Um, and, and, of course, eyesight and all those things, they have, they have sight, they know when you're home, they start wagging their tail, they recognise you, so they, they have all these things which are on the outside. They have some of these things uh, on the uh, inside as well. They, they might have memory. Um, they have affections. Um, they might reason things out, like if they want to make a tool, like chimpanzees. Sometimes they make tools and things to, to try and dig out for food and, and things like that. So they have all these things. Um, but there are other things which are missing. And, of course, there's no, none of this. There's no faith. Um, although they might have some sort of faith in you, uh, but it's, which is not faith in God. Um, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. Okay, so the soul uses these five senses of the body as the means of self-expression and communication with the outside world. Okay, makes expression with the outside world.
So you think something is beautiful, you explain. So you go to an art gallery and you say, look at all those spots and, you know, colours and things. Isn't it just rubbish? <laughs> <laughs> or somebody else might see something different in it and use that, um, those things. So it's a, it's a means of communication with the outside world. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Oh boy, it's nearly 20 past already. <clears throat> okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now notice this capital S, so it's the Holy Spirit. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So we want to make this connection. There's a, an operation that is happening. We know that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder the difference or dividing right in between the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. So the soul and spirit, and then you have the division, and then you have the joints and marrow, which is the body. Okay. So we have that separation. So when you look at uh, verse 14 there, the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. What does that then mean in terms of that? Because they have not received or have not been saved they haven't what they don't have the holy spirit yep not separated not separated okay so their their soul and spirit and their body then they're still natural they haven't been divided asunder okay they haven't been separated by god by salvation okay so they are still the natural man which is Body, soul, and spirit. They're still all connected together. They haven't been separated. And it's only in salvation that the, the word of God which pierces asunder, or what's the word asunder mean? Separate, yeah. Separate. So when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are then separated unto him. You are separated from your body. It's like God takes... Uh, a laser pen or a beam or whatever, and he goes, Shh, and then that's separated. You're separated now from your body, as it were. You're not no longer natural, no longer natural. And so, uh, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so. That needs uh, to happen. So from the above, we can clearly see why the unregenerate man cannot understand spiritual things until his spirit uh, nature has been renewed. And that means that separation has taken place. Okay? So when a, when a man dies, his soul and spirit separate from the body... And the body is laid in the grave, but the spirit is not bodiless. It has what Paul calls uh, physical, is that it? So, uh, so, yeah, uh, soulish body. Okay? So, we are separated. Separated. And we're, because of the what the Word of God um it's done. So the gate of imagination corresponds to sight. We have the gate of conscience. Conscience corresponds to smell. It detects the presence of good and evil. Uh, the gate of memory corresponds to hearing, by which the soul recalls what it heard. The gate of reason corresponds to taste, 
This allows the soul to compare facts as the body compares tastes of food. Uh, the gate of affections corresponds to touch being, uh, by, uh, being the hand by which the soul feels the person of the one it loves. So the word soul has various meanings in scripture. So if that's so we've been separated by God's word. So let's then get a little bit more into the word soul. What is the word soul? And spirit and in that. So the word soul has various meanings in scripture. It sometimes is referred to the whole man, as in Genesis 2 7. We've already been there. Uh, often refers to uh, conscious, immaterial part of man which exists beyond death, separated from the body. Bible words must be defined in the context. So when we look at a particular word, so the word soul, then we have to make sure we look dealing with it in the context in which it was said. Okay, So man became a living soul uh, is, is a bit different than, you know, this is the whole of me. So, Old Testament teaching on the word soul. Let's have a look at a few uh, passages there. So, Genesis chapter 35, verse 18. Genesis 35. Verse 18. <clears throat> and it came to pass, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benai, Benonai, Ben. But his father called him Benjamin. That's a better name. <laughs> well, there's another B. Did we say Ben, Benjamin? Benoni. Obi one Kenobi. Oh, yeah. um, okay, so what is the soul here? It it's clearly says when the soul was departing. Where is it parting? Yeah. So is this is this the life? When the soul was departing, does that mean that the life was leaving the body? That she was dying? You know, we have um, people who have departed this life. Or is it the soul that was departing? Both. Both. <laughs> it could be. See, it's the interpretation, isn't it? So... Um, it could be that someone's just dying. That's all it could mean. Rather than talking about the soul that was departing. But we would read it as the soul was departing. Like, you know, absent with, from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So the soul was departing. Yeah, so? It's the dying. It's the dying. See, now you're adding things to what you... Perceived or have been taught previously. Yeah, because it doesn't say the soul has departed. No. It says it's departing. Yes. Because she was still alive, wasn't she? She was able to name the child. But of course, the. Um, was... It says that she died. Yeah, for she died. Yeah, so it's yeah. in the process of. Yes, in the process of dying. Mm. So, does that mean just before you die, your soul departs? Or is departing, so a little bit leaves. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, when you're dead, it goes. Well, in the experience, it comes back. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why some people come back to life again. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, let's have a look at the next one. First Kings 17. Twenty-one. 
verse 21 and 22. <clears throat> and he stretched himself upon the child three times, one for the body, one for the soul, one for the spirit. Is that right? Why three times? Why not just once? Did the first one not work? No, so he had to try it again, and it didn't work. So he had to do it three times. And cried, it's, it's almost like going to a charismatic church service, you know. That's why people keep on coming up and going back again. And they're no better when they come back the second time. Still no better. And the third time, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Um, 21, and as he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Where was the soul? Or was the soul mean the life? It was departed and came back. See, it's, it's how people interpret these verses as to whether a soul sleep or not, isn't it? It just means life, and the soul... The life is gone. It's all, you know, the life of the body. It's a lifeless body. The body is dead. But that verse does teach something clearly there that the, the life, the soul, yes. left as an entity, if you like, doesn't tell us about its consciousness or anything. No, else, no, that's right. But it, the entity of it left yep. and came back. So that at least establishes. That the soul yes. is separate from the body and yes. can yes. be separate from the body. Yep. And we've already established that yeah. by the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and, and that. We've already established that. But what else is you see in that verse? Who's in control of all this? God. God. Okay? Because look at um, uh, verse, the end of verse 21 there. O oh Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again. So it was gone, but it's come back. <coughs> so is it just a life? So does, no. that, does that mean that these numbers, what they call them, near-death experiences, and they actually get to the gate, and they get sent back? It can happen. I don't want to go down that road <laughs> just now. <laughs> a lot of these people have their near-death experiences are not saved in the first place some of them some people are I know you've got well, we've got the book you know voices from the edge of eternity so people that are dying their death experiences are written down um, okay so clearly these verses, soul departed, and in the case of 1 Kings, the soul returned. Uh, obviously the prophet Elijah did not have the same idea about uh, and death, that the soul and death, as some others do, which teach that man's soul does not have, does not leave uh, the body. Um, the Old Testament connects the soul of man with his desires and earthly appetites as well. The soul hungers and thirsts in Isaiah 29, 8. Um, in fact, it's, half, it's just after half past now. We'll pick this up uh, next week and, and continue to look at uh, the word soul. And um, so we want to build on what we know from God's word so that when we come to look at soul sleep, then we are actually quite convinced of the position, biblical position, right? Not what I've taught or what anybody else has taught, but what the biblical position is of soul sleep. Is it right or is it wrong? Is it true or is it false? Okay? From the biblical perspective. We want to have the Berean spirit, okay? We want to have the Berean spirit. Okay, we'll finish there and we'll pick it up again next week. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here this morning to open your word. We do thank you, Lord, for every opportunity that we have to study your word. 
And Father, how wonderful it is to know who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you, Father, for teaching us and, for, and uh, showing us how uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you yourself, Father, through your word, uh, divides uh, <coughs> the body from the soul and spirit. And we do praise you and thank you, Lord, for showing that to us in your word. We thank you, Father, for showing us that also uh, the soul departs uh, from the body and, Father, can also return to the body. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for that. We ask you, Lord, also to uh, be uh, with each and every one of us as we continue to serve you this morning, uh, but be with our fellowship and uh, as we part participate of uh, morning tea this morning, we give you glory and honour in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.